Hey everybody, I want to read to you today from the book of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Many people take pride in their religious heritage or pedigree, how many of their relatives served in the church or in ministry, how long they have been a Christian, even where they were baptized or who baptized them. Other people take pride in their religious education, how many degrees in theology they have or if they have attended a well-respected seminary. But the Apostle Paul said, I'm only going to boast in the cross. In other words, Paul never emphasized what he had done for Christ, but only what Christ had done for him. The voice translation says this, may I never put anything above the cross of our Lord Jesus. The cross is the very heart of the gospel. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, the gospel is called the word of the cross. It also says to those who are saved, it is the power of God. But if there is no cross in your message, there is no power in your gospel. The cross is the center of the Christian life, the point around which all other things should revolve. The cross should never be treated as a side issue, something that we only mention in passing. The cross is the foundation of our faith. There are about 13 sermons recorded in the book of Acts, about that number. And in the vast majority of them, practically all of them, the main point and the central theme was the death and the resurrection of Christ. In other words, the early church preached the cross every day, not just on holidays, not just during Easter time. It was their constant message. The New Testament writers, especially Paul, relate everything to the cross. They deal with issues in life in the light of the cross. For example, in Romans chapter 14, verse 15, it's talking about whether we can eat certain foods that are clean or unclean. And Paul says, by the Spirit, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And again, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, talking about marriage, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in his death. Billy Graham tells this story. He says there was a police officer in England who found a little boy on the street crying with tears streaming down his cheeks. He was lost and couldn't find his way home. The policeman began to name certain streets, but the boy was not familiar with any of them. But looking up, the boy saw a large church spire that towered over their city with a large white cross on top. And pointing to it, pointing up to it, he said to the policeman, if you can get me to the cross, I can find my way. In many ways, I think the church is like that little boy. If we don't keep the cross in the center of our lives, we're going to wander away and get lost. Friends, there are many well-meaning and well-known Bible teachers today who hardly ever mention the cross.
Without the cross, our teaching degenerates into nothing more than a self-help talk. If our preaching isn't cross-centered, it isn't Christ-centered. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Many people, many people would say, oh, well, we're just exalting Jesus. We just want to talk about Jesus. But Paul said, not only do I preach Christ, but Him crucified. Without the cross, you're not preaching Christ. It is not sufficient to tell people that God loves them and wants to bless them. That's all true, absolutely true, but it's not enough. Throughout the New Testament, the love of God is constantly linked to the cross. For example, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says that we should love others as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Again, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10 says, Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Passion is not a substitute for knowledge. In fact, zeal without knowledge is dangerous. We, the world, needs to know and the church needs to understand the power of the cross. When I say cross, I'm not referring to a religious icon. I'm not talking about a cross that you wear around your neck or that's on the wall. Not a symbol, but the actual historical event of the death and resurrection of Christ. And friend, no matter how much God loves you or how great his grace, apart from the cross, God can do nothing for you. The cross is the altar on which the Lamb of God was offered. It's fitting that the chief priests put Christ on trial since under the law it was their job to examine the sacrifice to make certain that it was without defect. And it is no coincidence that Christ was offered that he died during Passover. As he breathed out his last breath, Matthew chapter 27 verse 51 tells us, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was 60 feet wide, 30 feet high, and the width of a palm of a man's hand. And it was torn from top to bottom, which indicates it was not something a man did, but something God did. Formerly, only the high priest could enter into the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. But because of the cross, now anyone can enter in. Through Christ, we can now cross over. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, it says we can enter by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is to say, his flesh. Now, Jesus had told the Jews, if you tear down this temple, in three days I will raise it up. And John chapter 2 verse 21 says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, his body was the real temple of God. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally in the Greek language, tabernacled among us. And when his flesh was torn, so was the veil. On the Day of Atonement, 
Aaron, the first priest, laid his hands upon the sacrificial goat, confessing the sins of the nation. And symbolically, those sins were transferred to the scapegoat. But Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 tells us concerning Jesus, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sacrifices under the law were only a type and shadow, a picture, but Christ is the reality. And he not only bore our sins, but he also carried away our sicknesses. Again in Isaiah 53 and verse 4, we read, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Literally, in the Hebrew language, sicknesses and pains. I've heard some people say that God is cleansing the church through this COVID-19. But that's absolutely false. No, my friend, that is incorrect. God is not putting anything on you that Jesus already took for you. Sickness does not improve the body, and it doesn't improve the body of Christ either. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church and not sickness. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 3, Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. He didn't say you are clean because of the sickness I have given to you. Again, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 and 26, it says, As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. He does not sanctify the church with a Chinese virus. Let me also read to you another scripture. In John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See, the Bible tells us when the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness, poisonous snakes entered the camp and bit the people and many died. Moses prayed and God told him what to do. In Numbers chapter 21 verse 9 we read, So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. It's interesting, this serpent was made of bronze. All of the furnishings outside of the tabernacle, like the laver and the altar, were made of bronze. But all of the furnishings and instruments inside the tabernacle were made of gold. Where the sacrifices were offered, it was bronze. But where the blood was sprinkled, it was gold. And bronze is an alloy mixture of copper and other metals. And perhaps, in the Bible, it symbolizes humanity. Christ took upon him human flesh so that he might die. But a serpent represents a curse. God cursed the serpent in the garden. But the Bible tells me in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He took the curse to become our cure. The Israelites who had been bitten by the vipers were instructed to look to the bronze serpent lifted on a pole. And those who looked lived. They were not just forgiven of their sins, but still died of the snake bite. As they looked, it neutralized the poison of the snake and they were healed. Likewise, 
we not only find forgiveness at the cross, but also healing. In Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, in the Amplified Version, it says, when he looked to the serpent of bronze, attentively, expectantly, with a steady and absorbing gaze he lived. We need to look to the cross, but it deserves more and requires more than just a passing glance. We must look attentively and expectantly. The snakes were still hissing around the ankles of the Israelites, but their focus was on that serpent on a pole. They could hear, no doubt, the cries of pain and anguish all around them in the camp, but they would not be diverted from their focus. They were looking only to the serpent on that pole. And in the same way, we must not allow the hissing lies of that serpent of old to detour and to distract us. Even in our pain, we must look to the cross. In closing, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 says, By which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Jesus did not die for himself. He took our place. And so everything he accomplished has been credited to our account. So in the mind of God, when he died, we died with him. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, By the Holy Spirit, I have been crucified with Christ. Through the cross, I'm dead to this world and its ways. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sickness. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. It's all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And may the cross never lose its place in our lives and in the church of God. Thank you and God bless you.